uh, have some other Texans that registered for the webinar. So greetings and hook them. And uh, of course, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the uh, complicated mix of feelings that all of us with ties to Austin have around what's been taking place uh, there over the last several days and weeks, and certainly have my thoughts and prayers with the people of Austin as they work through this uh, crazy time. But uh, for those of you who aren't aware, Austin bills itself as the live music capital of the world, and I thought it was appropriate then to start this presentation, which I'm jumping right into, with a musical uh, metaphor of sorts. There's a song that was recorded uh, probably 10, 15, 20 years ago by these two gentlemen, Mr. Billy Joel uh, on the left, who actually was a classmate in high school of my mother-in-law and Mr. Garth Brooks. They recorded this song and it has two lyrics that I have frequently turned to for inspiration as I do this work in public engagement. Uh, I don't have the power now, but I don't have it anyhow, so I gotta let it go and thought I'd never compromise. Oh, but you convinced me otherwise, which I would say should be the mantra for uh, all married men, but that's not what we're here to talk about today. Um, but when it comes to not having the power now and not wanting it anyhow, so I got to let it go, I, I think we have to um, really recognize that it, at this point in our history as a nation, it doesn't so much matter whether we're going to give the public a bully pulpit, they can find a way to bully their way onto that pulpit. And by that, I mean, they can flood social media and, and email they can sue a city or a government to get their way. They can put an item on the ballot and force a public vote. They can sit down in the street or march in the street and block traffic and cause uh, a lot of resources to be expended on their behalf. So, you know, I think it's up to us as we think about engagement to think about how we can do that proactively, thoughtfully, fairly, and inclusively. And I'm going to step through what I think each of those means in this context. So when it comes to engaging proactively, for me, what that means is that we have to, first of all, start at the beginning of the decision making process. You know, a lot of us in government spend a lot of time thinking about what we think a particular policy should be, or in this case, what we think the, the vision for our, the future of our community ought to look like. And that's often something that elected officials think about a lot as well. But I think the more that the public can be asked about their uh, response to that question, you know, what is their vision, um, the more likely it is that they're going to sort of buy into whatever the final result is, because they're going to feel as if they had a role to play. It's kind of like if, if you and a, a partner or a roommate were looking for a new home, you know, you could be asked at the very end to come look at one place and, and you know, decide whether or not you like it, and if you do, you're moving in, and if you don't, you're not, um, or to be able to sit down at the beginning and say, how many bedrooms do we need, what neighborhoods are we looking at, what kind of a place do we want to be in, uh, you're more likely, I think, to be excited about the eventual choice than if you're confronted with it at the 11th hour. Um, I also think it's important that we not just be reaching out to the public um, before uh, or at the time of a crisis. A lot of times, cities and other levels of government are making their sort of initial foray into connecting with the public during, for example, a public safety crisis or a weather event or what have you. And I think it's very hard to convince people that you really want to be in dialogue with them and engage with them if you're only um, in touch with them when uh, the chips are really down. And uh, going hand in hand with the notion of getting the public involved at the beginning is getting them involved at a point where they actually have the chance to influence whatever the final outcome is. You know, there's nothing worse than putting uh, someone in a position where you're asking for their opinion on something that's already a foregone conclusion. That, that obviously can erode trust significantly and that can be very hard to repair. So even if you can't involve the public at the very beginning of the decision-making process, it's okay if decisions have already been made along the way, but you want to involve the public at a point where they can still influence the final outcome. So for example, in a planning context, you may have decided that a particular section of your community needs to be um, you know, reserved for uh, environmental protection. There are lands in Austin that are you know, forbidden from being developed for that purpose. Um, that's fine, but it would be nice to let the public weigh in on, you know, the exact boundaries of those lands or what should be permitted on those lands or where exactly development should occur and in, in what ways. So that's what I mean when I say giving the public a chance to weigh in when they can still influence the outcome. 
Now, how do we do this kind of engagement thoughtfully and inclusively? What do I mean by that? Um, we first have to consider who's going to be impacted. And a lot of times we are prone to think of the people impacted as being just the people who are showing up to our meetings or speaking during public comment. And the reality, of course, is much more complicated that the decisions that a government makes will impact usually everyone in that community in most cases, and they could have impacts beyond because if people do business in that community or visit that community, book conventions in that community, um, they would all potentially have reasons to be impacted. So it may be, it may seem very difficult to engage that wide ranging of a population, but that's part of what I want to talk to you about today. But thinking through all of the people who might be impacted, not just all of the ones who are showing up to the meetings, I think is really important. And again, noticing who isn't there, you know, oftentimes, and we'll talk about this a little bit more in a moment, the people most impacted by a particular decision, especially in a land use context, aren't able to devote the extensive amount of disposable time and sometimes even money to participate in a protracted discussion about land use. They just simply have to focus on making sure they can uh, earn enough to support their families. So we need to be very conscientious in examining who has been a part of the discussion and who hasn't and what efforts we're gonna make to bring those people into the fold. And we really wanna think about exactly what it is that we're going to be asking. You know, On the one hand, we want to ask an open-ended question in most cases because we're interested in getting uh, a wide range of viewpoints. So for example, you know, not asking a, a, a question that could be answered with a yes or no, but instead a question that could be answered with a more thoughtful, uh, longer response. At the same time, we wanna ask a specific enough question that we get the kind of input that can actually be integrated into our final product. So for example, you know, just asking um, what people see in the future of our city is nice, but I think it's helpful to go deeper. You know, where, where should the population be concentrated in our city? Where should our residential population be focused? Uh, how much density are we willing to accommodate? You know, how much are we willing to support additional investments in transit? Those kinds of questions I feel like that are a little bit more uh, specific are more likely to get a response that can be better utilized by the planning uh, team and, the, and the, uh, the government as they move forward. Then we have to uh, think about the, the different ways that we can be fair in our engagement. And that may seem like a peculiar word, but it goes back to what I was saying before that some people are going to have a lot of difficulty coming after work uh, to a meeting. Most of our meetings are often taking place after work because we think that that's the best time to do it. But in reality, you know, someone like me with two young children at home is probably not going to arrange for a sitter or even leave my wife at home alone just to go to a, a public meeting. Uh, so we need to be thinking about different times of meetings, different times of the week, different times of the day accommodations at the meetings for childcare or children's activities and having the meetings in locations that are convenient, not just in terms of being central downtown, which would be very difficult to get to at certain times of day, but across our communities. Um, what, what kinds of information do we need to provide people up front? We can't assume that people have uh, a planner's level of understanding of what goes into a planning and visioning exercise. What, what should we be sharing with them to kind of get everybody up to speed? And I'll show you an example of that in a moment. How can people participate? And this gets back to thinking beyond just who can show up at a meeting to other forms of engagement, which I'll talk about more in a little while. And I think this one is really important. How do we complete the feedback loop? Which means how do we demonstrate to people that their input actually influenced the final outcome? Uh, in other words, how we used their feedback in the final product. That I think is something that we really have to demonstrate because otherwise people tend to believe that the, the wealthier, uh, more well-connected people in their community have, have sort of called the shots and they've been left in the cold. So we have to show them that we actually made use of what it was they told us. Now, going back to the song lyric for a minute, there's this part of it that says, thought I'd never compromise, oh, but you convinced me otherwise. My background is in conflict resolution as a, as a mediator. And what I've observed in, in matters of contentious public policy and planning can certainly be that is people tend to get into these, you know, entrenched positions, you know, they're, they're pro growth, they're anti growth, they're not in my backyard, they're in my backyard. Um, and those positions can be very difficult to, you know, sort of get past and find a solution that's going to satisfy everybody. They also tend to stereotype people on the other side, you know, the 
there are no growthers over there that don't care about, you know, welcoming new people into our community or, you know, the people that are pro-growth are just trying to infest our community with a bunch of, of folks that think differently than we do. But I think if we do things well, what we end up with is a, a safe space for all viewpoints to be shared and a, a set of discussion agreements that we agree upon when we get together so that people can disagree and do so without fear of retribution. And we open the door to possible collaboration and win-win solutions. And of course, win-win solutions have, has become a cliche. But the important thing is the last part, based on underlying interests. In other words, when someone takes a position like I'm for a rail project or against it, we want to try to understand what lies beneath those positions. What are the values that underpin the position that you're taking? Because oftentimes the values that underpin the positions that are diametrically opposed to each other are actually values that are shared. And so we can begin to develop ideas for solutions based on those shared values rather than trying to pick a winner and a loser around those positions. So I think in a planning and vision and context when we have so many metaphorical mouths to feed, as it were, when we have so many people we're trying to satisfy and get on board with our vision and our plan, it's really important that we understand the underlying values that in, in many ways unite our communities. So at the end of the day, this is really about the public and public policy, and that sounds kind of uh, mundane, but I think that that's really what it comes down to. We need to find a way to reach all of the affected stakeholders. And when I think about some of the harder to reach populations, these are some of the groups that I have in mind. Now, seniors is kind of a funny category because I'm sure we've all seen uh, some senior citizens that make it to every single one of our meetings and speak at every single one of our meetings. And I understand that, but I think we have to acknowledge that a lot of seniors have mobility difficulties or they don't hear very well or in other ways are sort of limited in their participation. So they can be uh, hard to reach. They also sometimes are less connected via technology. The disabled can refer to both physical and mental, but I think a lot of times we underestimate the obstacles in place for someone with a disability from uh, getting to the meeting, let alone participating. In many of our communities, and I know there are quite a few diverse cities on the line, uh, we have po large populations of people for whom English is either their second language or not a language that they speak. And so while we, of course, should be using English uh, as at least one of the languages in, in our engagement, we also need to find ways for people without that fluency to be able to participate. And when I talk about youth, I'm really referring to um, anyone up to the age of you know, 25 or 30. And I really want to emphasize the sort of pre-voting age population, because I think we're inclined to think about voters or taxpayers. The reality is, of course, that people of all ages pay taxes when they buy things. And a lot of the policies and plans and visions that we're working on will actually have a disproportionate effect on the youth more so than the uh, older population. And so it's incumbent upon us to think about age uh, appropriate ways to get uh, even pre-voting populations involved in the mix. And then of course, there's the large category that I've labeled here low income, which I mention again, just to, to note that it can be quite an imposition for someone to get involved sometimes in government in terms of the time required and the fact that it's obviously unpaid it's, it's time they're giving up from earning a living or being with their families to, to participate. And so what can we do to make that as um, uh, time unintensive as possible? And at the end of the day, one thing that I notice when uh, communities do planning and visioning is that oftentimes they sort of do a big splash of their engagement during that process. And then unfortunately, a lot of that drops off until the next time that they're gonna do visioning. And, Hopefully what we're doing is creating a culture in which people feel that whenever an issue comes up in our community, we'll have the opportunity to engage in dialogue and influence the outcome rather than just having it be during this visioning process. So it requires a little bit of a change in viewpoint. Sometimes I, I use the metaphor of a, uh, a citizen being at a, a snack machine for government and they put their tax dollars in and outcome their services with very little for them to say about it. They are consumers and not creators. They often are upset by how much they're having to pay for certain services and others are defining what they're going to get. Whereas a citizen, <clears throat> excuse me, and I of course don't mean this in an immigration context, but just a, a generic citizen is actually involved directly in determining the future of that person's community and understands that only through them will actual change uh, occur. Um, I also think that we have to acknowledge that there are challenges associated with doing engagement in this fashion, that we have a, a longer decision-making process. You know, if you think about 
some of the, the governmental processes that you've been involved with in the past. They may have been simply a, a, a discussion of it at one city council meeting and then a vote. Well, that's obviously shorter than having several public meetings and the like, but you've probably also been part of processes where uh, an attempt to get a policy passed that quickly has gone awry and led to months, if not years, of additional delays in implementation. And so to a degree, even though we might be taking a little bit more time and investing a little bit more and doing a more complex form of engagement, uh, my contention based on empirical experience and, and data is that we end up with decisions that actually hold and last, um, that people can buy into much more easily, and it speeds up the program implementation. There's a lot less resistance to something that people feel is coming from the public's will as opposed to something that was imposed upon them by their decision makers. So I think it's important to evaluate that as you get into this kind of work. And of course, it also provides opportunities to build community where there may not have been some, where there have been geographic dispersion or, or other forms of disparity. So I think it's important to not just talk about this in the abstract, but share with you that this really is having an impact. There was a survey done by the American Planning Association that found a large majority of the public who actually link engagement and decision making and planning specifically as being essential to economic recovery and job creation. And a large majority of elected officials surveyed by the National League of Cities uh, said that their cities were going beyond just the kind of uh, compulsory public comment at the city council meeting to do something more, uh, you know, uh, forward thinking like what we're talking about here. It's also important to look at this from the impacts that it can have on actual government operations. You know, one of the things that most people think of when they think of engagement is sort of the, the emotive uh, aspects of it, the emotional side. It, it, it brings people together. It makes people feel better about their community and about their government. And I think all that's important. But there also was a study done that I've uh, put up here, and it'll be linked when you get the PowerPoint, that speaks to how better understanding of what the citizens want and what their feelings are about services actually helps to um, better, you know, decide on expenses and operations of the city and the plans that the city should have going forward. If people want to see the city go in a certain direction and the city goes in that direction, they're more likely to remain there and, and happily uh, support the city. So it's, it's not just a matter of, of what feels right or what the right thing to do is from a, a sort of ethical moral standpoint. It also is, a, in some ways, an efficiency measure, as has been shown. And a group out of the UK, uh, again, uh, called Involve, also found that specifically in a, in a um, healthcare context, that, that healthcare institutions that were involving the public in these kinds of decisions were getting uh, better services and improved outcomes. So I want to bring this back to planning, just because this is a conversation specifically about planning and visioning, and just you know highlight this um, uh, sort of definition from the American Planning Association of what planning actually is. And I think it's very significant to note that they include citizens in the mix of people coming together to build communities. Um, it, it's not thought of as being a profession that's done in a laboratory. Now, obviously, there are specialized um, experts who understand certain things about planning that some of us don't. And I want to honor those uh, planners' uh, expertises. And, and certainly, this definition speaks to what they can uh, do for communities that they work in. But I think the APA believes, and I agree with them, that citizens have to be a part of that equation. And so what that looks like is kind of what we're going to talk about here next. So there's a group called the International Association for Public Participation that some of you may be familiar with. And some years ago, they came out with this uh, set of international best practices for what public engagement really should be. Now, you'll notice these statements are pretty general. So for example, those affected by a decision have a right to be involved in the decision-making process. But if you unpack a statement like that, you realize that if I'm really thinking about everyone that's going to be affected by a decision made by a local or, or other level of government, that's a lot of people. And I've got to figure out a, a, a variety of different ways that I can involve them in the decision-making process if I'm really going to live up to that uh, standard. We have to promise the public that the contribution will influence the decision. I say we have to promise. We have to deliver on that promise. We have to tell them how their contribution will influence the decision and then show them. Uh, we have to think about the needs and interests of all participants, including decision makers, including elected officials who have certain political pressures that they have to be sensitive to. Uh, we also have to 
be again proactively seeking out people's involvement, not simply expecting that just because a council meeting is scheduled that people will show up, but actively promoting it uh, in uh, you know print form and in um, social media and all the like to make sure that people actually know about these opportunities to engage. One thing that I think a lot of people skip is the notion of actually asking the public how they want to participate. You know, could we get a theater troupe involved or an art gallery or a musical group? Could we get uh, video crews from the community involved in, um, in helping to document people's public uh, input? There are all different kinds of ways that people can uh, be a part of that design, but I think it, it's worth uh, asking as we begin the engagement process. We also need to think about how we convey information to people so that they can participate in a meaningful way. So we sort of level the playing field for all participants and not require someone to have high levels of expertise. And again, we tell participants how their input actually affected the decision that we made. You know, we heard from a large number of people that they want walkable communities. And so that's why we've, uh, you know, set up our plan to have more mixed use and, and denser development, for example saying that explicitly, showing how what the public said made it into your plan or your vision is extremely important for building trust and sustaining it over time. I've looked at some other sets of public engagement values that have been developed around the world, and these are just some of the highlights. Uh, most of them probably wouldn't surprise you, um, but I think one of the ones that uh, is very important to me is the notion of uh, inclusivity and diversity. And those can mean lots of different things, but to me, um, it, it doesn't just mean uh, racial and ethnic, although that's important. It also is socioeconomic. It's also uh, chronological diversity, meaning people of all ages, all parts of the city, uh, or, or affected population, and so on. So really putting some thought into that, I think, is, is very important. Another tool to consider when you're embarking on this work is what's called the public participation spectrum, again, from IAP2. So just briefly, you can look at this a little bit more online. But you'll notice that there are sort of different levels that we can involve the public. We could be just in an informative uh, stage where our, our main purpose is to let the public know what's going on. So, for example, thinking about the Austin uh, situation with the, uh, the criminal activity there, it's not like the public was going to show up at a bunch of town hall meetings on that topic, but they did want to be kept informed. On the other end of the spectrum, if we're going to ask for additional taxpayer dollars or change our city charter or state constitution, we're often going to put the final decision making in the hands of the public. For me, uh, comprehensive planning and a lot of the planning and visioning work that we're doing in our cities um, fall somewhere between involve and collaborate. And I think what's important about this diagram is a, as much as it reflects the public's increasing impact on a decision as you move from left to right, I would argue it also is worth considering how you could pick a level based on how much impact the decision will have on the public. In other words, a decision to raise taxes will obviously take money directly out of people's pockets. That's a pretty big deal. That's one of the reasons why that often ends up on a ballot at the empower end of the spectrum. Whereas, you know, potentially um, putting a fire out on the other side of town, while important, um, is a little less impactful perhaps on a, a, the day-to-day -day life of someone who's not living right near it. So maybe inform is, is an okay stance to take. And these are, are messages that can be used for the different levels of engagement. And I think, um, again, for the collaborative, which would be the fourth one from the left, you'll see it talks about um, working together to formulate solutions. In other words, rather than just presenting alternatives to the public, we're actually going to involve them in thinking through what those solutions might be and then getting some feedback on what they think the final uh, answer ought to be. So a few other um, uh, general points about keys to success, and then I'll, I'll talk some specifics here. Um, we, we've talked about being sure to identify all of the, the people who have a stake in the outcome, what pre-existing issues there may be in the community, what power imbalances there might be, which is to say who can already have a lot of influence and who's often left out, and where people tend to gather, where can we uh, reliably find people to get them to engage. Making sure that our information is um, easy to access, easy to understand, and that we're being very transparent about what it is that we're doing with their information. Uh, making sure that the process is clear. I, I once saw uh, an engagement group do placemats uh, that showed the way the process was going to work, and they used those same laminated placemats at meeting after meeting, and I thought that was really a valuable thing to do. Diversity of times for meetings. You know, a, a working uh, professional audience might prefer a breakfast meeting downtown 
families might prefer a weekend late morning with, with outdoor children's activities, for example. We also need to think about different ways to engage people, which I'll talk about here in just a minute. Using multiple media, of course, we think of our TV stations and our radio stations and our newspapers and the like, but we need to be thinking about other places people get their information, whether it be social media, an organization that emails them, uh, flyers that they may see at a, at a place they visit, uh, it could be a billboard. There are a lot of different things to consider in terms of how we publicize our engagement. We talked about having opportunities to participate from the very beginning. And one thing I want to really highlight here is framing the issues in an engaging way. It's one thing to say, um, you know, what's our vision for the future? Come tell us. Or, you know, we're having a planning meeting. Please show up. I think it's, it's altogether different to say our population could end up doubling in the next 25 years. How do we handle that? How do we manage that? Um, I've also seen communities talk in terms of having more projects or more um, services to provide than they have funds to provide it and asking the public how to, how to manage that shortfall. In, in either case, the point is to put yourself into the shoes of someone who might be hearing about these opportunities and ask yourself, what would motivate me or what has motivated me to get off the couch and, and be involved? And whatever that is could be integrated into the message that you send to the community. So we're really talking about some outside the box ideas here. And at the end of the day, these are the things we're trying to bring about, uh, engaging the disengaged and uh, creating a greater level of civility and better connections. So I wanna show a couple of examples here. This is taken from the Imagine Austin comprehensive planning process back in 2009 through 2011. What you're seeing on the screen is a map exercise in which we um, randomly assigned a mix of people to a team, to a table, and we gave them little uh, square game pieces. And the darker the square, the more dense the node of population. So in other words, um, a dark red square was like, uh, I don't know, 10,000 people in a square mile, and a lighter square was only 1,000. And we gave them enough game pieces to account for the an amount of population that we were expected to add in our city over the next 25 to 30 years. So they had to figure out collectively uh, where those residents should go. And what's interesting is you'd often have people living in, in uh, different parts of the city. So if someone tried to you know, pass the growth off onto one particular part of town, there was someone at their table saying, yeah, I'm not so sure about that. And it's, it was very striking also to see how quickly people um, created an enormous amounts of density in certain parts of town because there was so much that they wanted to protect. So it was both an education exercise, but also a very specific um, input generating exercise because ultimately we aggregated all of the dozens of maps that people prepared and gave the, the general public uh, four alternative growth scenarios to then consider for what would be our eventual preferred growth scenario. So I wanna emphasize that this is more than just a game, uh, that it had a specific purpose, but at the same time, the, the sort of game-like quality to it um, with the help of a facilitator, I think made it more interesting uh, for a lot of folks. Then we experimented with something called a meeting in a box, which is not a complicated invention and it's been used in, in a variety of places, but the concept is that most people uh, in your communities will not show up and may never show up at a, at a sort of called public meeting but they're often meeting elsewhere. They're often going to their homeowners association or their neighborhood association or their book club or their scout troop or their religious organization or their chamber. And at those meetings, we could empower them with a, a portable meeting that enabled them to integrate it into their existing organizational meeting and give us some helpful feedback. So you're seeing some screenshots from a, a budgeting exercise where as part of our plan for the future, we wanted to understand what specifically people felt we needed to emphasize more and, and what they were willing to trade off for that. But it can be used for really any purpose. And in a planning context, I'll be showing you in a minute a video that I produced for training hosts who were all just ordinary citizens uh, on how to host one of their meetings in a box. And that's coming up right now.
Hey, Larry, we're having trouble hearing the sound. Okay. Could you could you try um, turning it up on your computer or uh, make sure that you're unmuted? There we go. Before discussing your thoughts as a group. Here are some important tips for you as a facilitator leading the group discussion. Your primary role is to enable your group to have a productive conversation. To do so, you should keep in mind the following. Remain neutral in your treatment of all participants. Treat each participant with respect, no matter how much you may agree or disagree with the person's point of view. So this link will be available to you all later on for you to watch the remainder of it. But the point I was wanting to drive home about this is the significance of using uh, a video to empower ordinary citizens to be um, involved in the engagement process so that you're not depending upon having uh, unlimited numbers of staff people to carry this out, but can actually you know, recruit organizational leadership and uh, just ordinary people to facilitate these meetings and to make it a very intuitive process and a very inexpensive one too. You'll notice, um, you know, I was just using a typical mailer box and sticky notes and so on that ex actually ends up being a lot cheaper in many cases than what you spend on having four or five big uh, public meetings where it's hard to predict how many people will attend. So that's just a little bit more on uh, meeting in a box. So now I'll go back. Sarah, can you see the screen again? The slides. Anyway. Yes, we can. Okay, great. So um, another thing that I think is important to utilize is actually being in places that people are going to, not expecting them always to come to us. So kind of a, a reinforcement of the meeting in a box notion. Um, we call it Speak Week. It, it can be you know street-based outreach or you know person on the street interviews or whatever you want to call it. But in our case, one of the things we emphasized during uh, at Austin through other similar experiences was something people could walk up to and do that was in some way visually stimulating uh, rather than being one of those people that you've probably interacted with who is asking you on the street for a few minutes of your time to ask you to give money to something or convert to their religion or what have you. And I don't want to disrespect any of those folks, but I think a lot of us tend to ignore people in those circumstances. But if we see something that's visually compelling, we might stop, especially if we have a chance to impact our community. And in this case, these very young residents were looking at a uh, magnet a set of magnets corresponding to mobility modes and giving us some ideas about what they would like their street to like the street to look like. And so again, it, it comes back to having a, a way to engage that's quick, but still meaningful and compelling. And in this case, it influenced our uh, transportation bond that we put in the ballot uh, shortly thereafter. And here's another uh, quick clip that talks a little bit about doing stuff uh, on the street. This is a video that we took uh, during Imagine Austin for part of our street-based outreach. So as you can see, we look for help wherever we get it. But you know, the point is um, a not to be afraid of making a fool of yourself, but also um, you know, being on the street attracts a crowd. And you know, this was uh, the kind of thing that we think um, helped encourage participation just by virtue of the fact that people were walking past us and wondering what the heck is that all about, and stopping to ask us questions uh, and and learning about Imagine Austin that way, as opposed to getting an email or a tweet or a Facebook post. So that's a professional musician uh, who did a parody of the Doobie Brothers classic uh, that actually was about the Imagine Austin Comprehensive Plan. 
want to talk a little bit more about using community members. So we've developed something in Austin that we're hoping to bring to South Florida, where I'm based at the moment, called Conversation Core. And this is really nothing more than uh, doing a free training for volunteers to become facilitators all across the community in settings that people are more likely to be in. So a cafe or a church or a senior center. Uh, so it's a, a half-day training that we do on, on how to be effective facilitators of dialogue. And then we complement that with discussion guides on particular topics that are relevant. So in the case of planning and visioning, you can imagine a, a pretty basic discussion guide with some questions that kind of whet people's appetite for thinking about what the future of the city or community should be like. And then uh, having your volunteers fan out all across your city. Again, this gets back to sort of uh, multiplying your forces and, and making the most of the resources that you have, because it can be very uh, time consuming and uh, staff intensive, labor intensive and expensive to do full fledged public meetings uh, to cover your entire community. But if you can recruit facilitators from uh, the community to help with that, then you can, I think, get a, a bigger return on your investment. I want to talk a little bit about technology because I think there's no secret that um, one of the best ways to reach large audiences is through the use of technology. I do want to make sure, though, to emphasize that when we're thinking about technology, we think beyond simply the Internet and a computer, um, even though statistics that I'll show you in a moment demonstrate that most Americans are now uh, able to get online. We need to think also in terms of text messaging and, and telephone-based engagement. But this is particularly for people who have limited time, who don't feel comfortable speaking in public, who don't have the means or resources to meet in person. Here's some quick statistics from the Pew Research Center that show you both that, the, uh, that a large majority of Americans have high-speed internet access at home, although that varies significantly across different uh, groups, uh, but also that a quarter or more of people don't have internet access at home. Um, and also the ubiquity of cell phones and the ability to communicate that way via text or app or the like. So one of the things that we've done is to leverage the resource that most communities have of a public access television station or a government access station. This is a screenshot of a televised town hall meeting that we hosted that was specifically about our zero waste uh, plan and our vision for the future of, of having uh, net zero amount of material to the landfill versus material going other places like recycling and composting. And what you'll notice is people were given a question on screen and they could tweet or text their answer. They could also call in and uh, use a touch tone phone to give their answer. For this meeting, we had some in-person meetings that got about 25 or 30 people each. This meeting had more than a thousand people. And so I'm not saying that to sound boastful. I'm saying that to make you appreciate that you do have at your disposal some resources that you can leverage to increase engagement in your planning and visioning process. You just have to be uh, willing to put in the time to figure out how best to, uh, to use them. Now, they also can be used for, um, the, the, the station, I should say, can also be used to provide um, some overview videos as part of the beginning of a process, and I'll show you one of those here in just a moment. You can picture a, a public meeting where people might show up and, and be of all different levels of, of awareness uh, of what it is that the, the, the planning process is really all about. A, a short video can serve the same function that a museum exhibit might uh, have an introductory video for. Before you go through the exhibit, or in this case the public workshop, you can sort of be briefly in, in less than 10 minutes brought up to speed on what exactly is happening. It also has an advantage in that you know, if someone misses the introductory presentation or if a staff member is giving the same presentation over and over again, you're not going to, you know, forget a detail. It's always going to be the same no matter who's watching it because it's the same footage each time. So I will show you that here in just a moment. I just also want to emphasize the uh, resource of telephone town hall meetings. This is a screenshot from Fort Lauderdale where I did some work on their visioning. And in Fort Lauderdale's case, they didn't use the TV station, but they did use just a typical uh, basically conference call that people could either call into or they might get a call and be able to uh, participate in the direct dialogue with the mayor in this case as part of that visioning process. There's a video that I'm going to skip just for time that's uh, an overview of the Fort Lauderdale process and I'll just briefly show you this uh, Austin overview video. The city of Austin sits in the heart of one of the fastest growing and dynamic regions of the country, and we're expecting our historic growth to continue. 
So the city of Austin is asking you, how should we grow? The Imagine Austin Comprehensive Plan is being created to answer that question. The plan is required by our city charter and will provide a new long-range vision for the city. It's a powerful, serious plan that can have the force of law and will guide all city investments of your tax dollars. So far, we've asked you what you love about the city, what you want to improve, and what you would like to see in the future. Based on what the community has told us, the City Council has endorsed a vision statement to guide the plan and Austin's future. We've also developed four imagined visions, which we're calling scenarios, showing how Austin could grow and become better, not just bigger. But before we decide what type of place Austin should be in 20 or 30 years, let's take a quick look back to see how we got to where we are today. So the important thing here is not just giving people uh, an overview of the planning process and why we're doing a plan, but also to speak to what's happened so far and how we've incorporated the input that we've received. Again, trying to demonstrate to people that, in fact, their input is worthwhile, that it's making a difference, and that they're truly having a chance to impact the final outcome. Just a couple of more slides, and then I would love to take some questions if you all have them. I want to show you some screenshots from some other tools that can be very useful uh, in bringing technology into planning. This is a screenshot from a company called MetroQuest, which I think has done um, really remarkable things in the survey space. So this is very specifically meant for surveys as opposed to uh, dialogue. Uh, but in this case, what you're seeing is one of, of dozens of screenshots in which people can um, visualize different growth scenarios or mobility strategies and also give input by dropping uh, pins on a map, as well as seeing how a particular scenario responds to the various priorities that they're concerned about. So as you see here, there are different pages to the survey. And once you've completed the part about what priorities are most important to you, you then can evaluate which approach you want based on your priorities, not just on a, a reflex as to which approach might look the best. So I think that's really a valuable resource that the MetroQuest is providing. This is from a uh, company called Crowdbright, and they've really done an enormous amount of work in the planning space, you know, particularly integrating it with uh, charrettes and other events at which people are really getting their hands dirty looking at the land uh, in question, whether it be a map or, or out in the, in the community. And in this case, you're, you're seeing an interface where people can add uh, sticky notes, you know, virtual sticky notes, you might say, to indicate some of the ideas that they have or to champion ideas that they see other people making in the context of a plan for the future. It's also a firm that I've been uh, doing some work with called Engaging Plans, the Urban Interactive Studio, and they've got a variety of different interfaces that I really like. The one on the left is helpful for having people wrestle with different trade-offs that could be associated with a long-range plan. Uh, they can slide those red buttons to indicate they want to spend more or less on something, and the icons change to indicate how much of something they're going to get for that expenditure, but they also could run out of, of funds and they have to work within a budget. Up on the top is a, an indication of how um, a city is planning to update their land use, uh, you know, land development code and future land use map and the ability of people to, you know, pinpoint exactly how their neighborhood might be impacted and give feedback there. Uh, a way to indicate priorities through dropping and, and sliding different uh, aspects of the, of the planning process into these different boxes. So there's all different kinds of ways to do it. And the thing I want to really emphasize is you, you have to put yourself into the shoes of each different kind of person that might want to participate. Is it the senior who, you know, the only way they're going to participate is if you happen to catch them at home on the telephone? Is it the millennial who would never think of going to a government meeting for any reason but would easily respond to a text message if they were given the opportunity? Uh, is it a middle-aged person who's more comfortable in Spanish who would gladly be part of a, a fireside chat of sorts or a kitchen table conversation with someone speaking in Spanish, a, a plactica, uh, as, as it sometimes is called? Um, imagine yourself in those shoes and then think through what would entice them and what would entice yourself to be part of a process like this. One thing about planning and visioning is that it's exciting. Um, it's, it's, it's exhilarating to feel like you're part of something bigger than yourself and to help shape a community, particularly for your children and your grandchildren. But actually getting people to do that is another story, and I think we have to think very carefully about removing some of the many obstacles, some of which are very subtle, to that participation. 
but I'm thrilled that you all have uh, patiently listened to my presentation, and I would love to take questions or feedback from you uh, for the remainder of time that we have. So thanks very much for listening. Great. Thank you so much, Larry, for volunteering your time to share this presentation with us. Um, if you all do have questions, please go ahead and put them in the chat um, just to the host, and I will field those for us. Um, we do have one question already um, for Larry, and that's uh, how do you approach elected or city staff who don't necessarily see the value in engagement? Um, how do you create the buy-in um, with your peers and colleagues? That's a great question. Um, this may sound a little bit um, pessimistic, but I think a lot of times what's going to influence uh, an elected official or even a, a high-level government official is an example from the past where um, lackluster engagement may have, have caused big problems. So for example, um, I'm working in a community here in Miami Beach where they've been attempting to do a lot of really uh, groundbreaking and progressive work to prepare for a, a catastrophic uh, storm event to deal with sea level rise and all of the various impacts of climate change on a community like Miami Beach. Unfortunately, I think that their engagement in involving the public in the decisions they were making that were going to affect their streets and their communities was um, not sufficient enough to meet the needs of that community. And so they're now having to pause a lot of that work until they can get some outside expertise in to determine uh, a good path forward. I also worked in a Midwestern community where they were undertaking some major infrastructure work and they had neglected to meaningfully involve a community, at least as far as that community was concerned, and a project was canceled and $15 million was lost, and I'm not exaggerating. So there can be a, a persuasive case made just on the basis of, you know, either do it fast or do it right, and, and giving examples from other places. I think there's also a significant political benefit to an elected official who's able to stand up alongside people from all different uh, perspectives and all different uh, political interests and say that she or he brought that community together. That's a very politically powerful, cap political capital rich maneuver. So when it comes to elected officials, I think there's a lot for them to gain from doing things in this fashion. And there certainly is a lot at risk if they uh, don't. And when it comes to colleagues, you know, sometimes people are convinced that um, the public doesn't know nearly as much as they do, and therefore they should be the ones to, to really make the decisions irrespective of what the public is telling them. The reality is that they, the staff people, ultimately report to, you could say, the elected officials, and the elected officials are going to listen to that public. And so even if I've developed the most technically sound solution, if it's not going to pass you know, public muster, it may or may not go through, and it's more likely not to go through. So the more that I can incorporate my own professional expertise alongside what the public's will is, the more likely my projects are to move forward. And I think that can be a persuasive case for people who actually want to see their plans get done or their policies enacted or their infrastructure, infrastructure projects completed. Great. Thank you. Sure. Uh, another question is about um, what's your advice to cities and communities who haven't done much in the engagement arena, um, those who only have the public comment as, as their main way for residents to formally get involved, where do you suggest they start? That's a great question. I would start with um, being creative with just their next public meeting. You know, assuming that the community has um, a desire to hear from the public uh, on something more than just at the 11th hour when the council is about to take a vote, you know, and, and there's an expectation that there will be a, a, an open house or some sort of public meeting separate from the council meeting. Um, think about different ways that you can design that meeting. You know, can there be an interactive exercise? Can there even just be a small group discussion happening rather than expecting all, you know, 10, 20, 50, 100 people to try to all speak in one group, which can be very intimidating for most of us? Can we number the name tags as people come in and then send people to the table corresponding to the number on their name tag and have a facilitator at each table to guide them through a set of, of discussion questions. Um, can we give people money to spend and, and find out how they're going to spend it, give them actual you know, monopoly money and 
find out how they're going to spend it. So if it were me, and, and this I think was the case for me when I first came to Austin doing public engagement, that's really where I, I spent a lot of my time was thinking about how to reform and, and reshape the experience someone had at a face-to-face -face meeting. And it was only later that I began delving into ways to leverage uh, technology. Um, but I think that that could be a really good place to start, and I'm happy to talk offline to, to give other suggestions. Great, thank you. We've got a few questions coming in um, specifically about how um, to do meetings with non-English speakers. Do you have some advice on how to host bilingual meetings, especially um, when they're smaller breakout sessions? Right. Um, and then also, do you have any specific examples or activities that have been particularly successful in Spanish and Latino Latino communities? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I think that, that the important thing is to be having the engagement feel less like something different and more like something that they are accustomed to. And I, I say they, that, that we are accustomed to. So in other words, if people are accustomed to talking about you know, local issues or the topic of the day around a kitchen table, then we should be empowering community facilitators to be um, having some of those conversations at kitchen tables. We shouldn't be you know, necessarily thinking that just because we advertise uh, the availability of simultaneous interpretation in Spanish, that that's going to attract someone to, to show up. I think what's going to attract someone to be involved is they're hearing about it either through a person or an organization that they trust. So that could be, again, a neighbor, a friend. Um, it also could be a church or a social service agency or an employer who they believe, you know, has their best interests at heart. Um, so part of it comes to the way in which we publicize and get the word out about the engagement opportunities and making sure that we are publicizing the event in various languages. And of course, at our meetings, we want to strive to make it possible for either there to be a, a small group breakout with people who speak another language or real-time interpreters for the main part of the meeting or the, the uh, public presentation. Um, but for my money, what I think really helps with the non-English speaking population is, is integrating into the existing fabric of those communities rather than expecting to attract them to something that may seem altogether foreign. We undertook something called the Asian American Quality of Life Initiative, which didn't feature um, just the larger languages like Chinese and, and Korean and Japanese, but you know, Malay and Burmese and all sorts of things. And so we relied very heavily on existing organizations that already work with those populations to be part of programming that they were doing or other forms of outreach that they were doing. Because why reinvent the wheel if they're already successfully reaching people in those populations and know culturally and idiomatically how to communicate, then I think it's worth partnering with them. And it, it might require an investment of funding to, to help with some of that outreach for that, that organization to help. Uh, but partnering with them to both get the word out and facilitate the dialogue in contexts that people really um, feel uh, puts them at ease. And, and in that same vein, I would say, not just in terms of training facilitators, but also in terms of leveraging the meeting in a box, because you know the more that a facilitator can take something along that's visual, that's a little bit easier to understand, um, and of course has to be in a, a language they can understand, but it doesn't have to be quite as verbal um, or, or verbose, I guess I should say, is what we did here. Um, you know, something that's that's more visual, like the example I gave with the the magnets um, that they can take to a community meeting or even just a kitchen table. Um, the the better off I think the response will be. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so one last question. Um, you spoke about how a lot of times these visioning and planning processes, there's a lot of engagement that goes into it. Um, but then it can kind of become a one-off uh, engagement strategy instead of really creating the culture of engagement. So how do you suggest um, people follow up on continuing to have engagement um, throughout local government planning after the uh, strategic plan or visioning process is completed? Absolutely, yeah, that's a great question. I mean, one of the aspects of Conversation Core is the fact that it's meant to be sort of permanent civic infrastructure, which is a a kind of a, a invoke term that basically refers to different initiatives and, and institutions that are contributing to making the community a better place. And so we built this not just for visioning and planning, but for any topic that the city or the school district or the transit agency wanted to engage the community on. 
So if you can create that kind of program that people are willing to commit to for a year or six months and then have regular opportunities to converse uh, on different topics, I think that's really worthwhile. I'm also going to pull up really quickly a, another link to show you guys. Um, I think the, the existence of a, a, an engagement tool that is built for more than just that planning process is also very important. This is a, an updated version of a, pr a platform I built a number of years ago, and the purpose of it is to do more than just, um, you know, distribute surveys, but actually have people engage in discussions. And one thing you'll see here is there are a whole bunch of different topics, and people, by giving us their email address to create an account, then get notified frequently about other topics on which they can engage. And what's good about that is instead of just getting the self-selected big interest groups on a particular topic, you're hearing from a broader array of the public. I mean, we've had as many as 6,500, 7,000 emails in the system uh, that we can tap as kind of a, a base of public opinion uh, through this website. And it's a relatively easy URL to remember and bookmark and so on, and we can promote it as we did on, on social and regular media. Um, the other facet of it that I think is really important is that it's not simply for um, asking surveys which are closed. Um, it's also for a, um, a discussion for people to have amongst one another that's moderated by a facilitator, in, in this case me. Um, but you'll see an, an open-ended question here and several responses that people gave that then um, people could respond to each other. So it became sort of a very civil and interesting dialogue that took place on the Internet um, that people could be a part of. But the point is that it, it became something that was more than just that, that one-off solution, but actually a resource that we turn to again and again to, uh, to grow our engagement. So that could be helpful. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, well, our time is up for now, but just a few quick um, pieces that will be in your follow-up email. Um, National Civic League does have a meeting in the box toolkit, similar to what Larry was talking about uh, earlier, and it's a free resource on our website, so I'll go ahead and include the link um, to that in your follow-up email. And um, Larry, myself, and a few other colleagues at the National Civic League also um, do community assistance and help uh, different cities plan their visioning and strategic planning processes. So if you all would be interested in that um, or want to learn more about how to get this started in your community, I'll include a link um, for that as well, as well as, well as all of Larry's um, contact information. Um, so again, thank you so much for joining us and thank you, Larry, for presenting. My pleasure. Thank you so much, Sarah, for having me.